Thank you. So yes, I'm Joanna Bristow Watkins. So um, you can probably tell from my name that uh, Bristow was my maiden name and uh, Alec Bristow was my father. So um, today we're going to be talking about his journey. And um, a lot of you I know will have seen the film, The Great Escape. And um, we watched it as kids. <laughs> um, so um, at the time, I wish I'd asked him more questions. Sadly, I didn't. But there you go. That's the same with a lot of people who have relatives that were active in the war. But uh, the layout or the, the, the profile, if you like, I'm going to be doing today, I'll start just talking a little bit about him as a person, a little bit about his RAF career before he was shot down. And then we will spend quite a lot of time on the Great Escape, or Stalag Luft III anyway, where the Great Escape was. And then if there's time, I'm hoping to tell you a little bit about the Long March, because it's very misunderstood and not very well known at all. And it was really terrible that they had to march many, many, many kilometres in freezing weather to, um, to get away from the advancing Russians. So um, anyway, if we've got time for that, we'll cover that as well. So this is the story, one man's story of the Great Escape, which happened on the 24th of March, 1944. If you've seen the film, you'll probably be familiar with some of the things in it, and we'll be talking about which aspects of it were absolutely accurate and which were not the first time. That might even um, get relegated to the questions, I don't know. But we'll definitely be talking about what it was like in the camp and what actually happened on that day. So here's a little bit about my dad um, to start with. He was born on the 20th of October, it's nearly his birthday, in 1916. And he was born in Epsom Workhouse, which is quite fascinating. Um, he was born to an unmarried mother, and we don't know who his father was. There are various, various different, um, what would you call it, rumours. <laughs> um, we don't know the answer to that. But he was brought up by his aunt and uncle, and they treated him as one of their own. They had seven children of their own. And as you can see um, from this picture here, they were a naughty bunch. <laughs> you can tell by the look on their faces, can't you? And uh, this, this here is Alec um, when he was a young boy. And then his first job, he was employed as a bacteriologist chemist and he worked for Holes and Dadigdor and they were down in Brighton. That's a picture of him working for um, Holes and Dadigdor. He's in the front row. <laughs> okay, so he enlisted in the RAF reserves in 1939, February 1939. And it seems that he teamed up straight away with Bernard Marshall, who became his observer navigator throughout the entire war until they were shot down. Here's a picture of him in front of his Hawker Hart in 1938. And this is them all dressed for flying. And as you can see, there he is with his pilot's collar on. Dressed for the air. Okay, so he got married to my mum in 1941 on the 8th of June. Actually, my husband, who's here today, we got married 50 years later <laughs> on their golden wedding anniversary, even though my father wasn't around then. But we kept the date special anyway. And um, he joined Bomber Command 107 Squadron to start with, which was Blenheim's. And he had this same team for 32 raids. And that's what they call it. You might think, what's that TOD up there? It stands for tour of duty. So a tour of duty was about 30 sorties, or I think a certain number of 100 hours of, of flying time or whatever. But their first tour of duty was 32 sorties. And those three were together for all of them. Bernd, Mar Bernd Marshall, Leslie Broughton, who was the gunner, and my dad. And that's what uh, a Blenheim looks like, if you aren't familiar with it. And um, they mostly did low level attacks on aerodromes. They did have one narrow escape where they got hit by lots and lots of flak and there was a lot of aircraft damage, but they did manage to limp home and everything was fine. Then in 1942, he was posted to Bovington to train US personnel. So this is not unusual. At the end of one tour of duty, what happened if you survived that tour of duty? And by the way, 50% didn't. So every time you went out on a sortie, you had 50% chance of not returning. And the average lifespan of a pilot in World War II was six weeks. So if you managed to survive your first tour of duty or your next tour of duty, then you did have a spell as an instructor for a while. So that was normal for, for him to go off and do that. 
So then we get a very exciting time um, in terms of aviation history because my dad was put to 105 Squadron, which was actually Mosquitoes. And the Mosquito was a brand new innovative plane. And we didn't realize until I was preparing for this talk that it was actually very prestigious to be invited to be a Mosquito pilot. You had to be pretty much at the top of your game. They just had a two man crew. And you can see here that they, they generally sat here. That's the cockpit there. And um, they had no gunner at all. So all you had was the pilot and the observer navigator. If you were attacked by a German fighter plane, you basically had to fly like a bat out of hell. That's the bottom line of it. And that's what they had to do. And luckily the Mosquito was super fast. So one of the first raids that was ever done on Mosquitoes was on the Gestapo headquarters in Oslo. And my dad was one of the four um, on that raid. And uh, to tell you that the Mosquito was amazingly made entirely of wood. And when it was first put forward by de Havilland, um, it was laughed out of the, <laughs> you know, they told her not to do that. It was a ridiculous idea, but it got approved in the end. And thank goodness it did, because it was the fact that it was so light that made it so fast. It was often called the wooden wonder, and it could fly up to almost 400 miles an hour, which is pretty amazing. And so they were known for doing low level, super high speed attacks. And they had to go for low level to really keep away from the fighter planes. So just to tell you a little bit about what a typical sortie would involve, this Gestapo headquarters was 1,100 round trip miles, flying time of 4.75 hours. And that was at that point, the longest um, sortie that had ever been taken on a mosquito. It had four 500 pound bombs with just an 11 second delayed action. So that meant that there was a reasonable chance that you would actually be damaged by your own bomb if you didn't get away fast enough. And they crossed the North Sea at heights of less than 100 feet. So they were just 30 meters off the sea. And they used this technique called dead reckoning, which the observer was trained in. So they would learn how to determine exactly where they were based on velocity and what they could see in their eye line, rather than going by stars and landmarks, because obviously over a large period of um, desert or lots of sea, there's not many landmarks to look out for. Okay, so um, the next raid that he did was over Holland, um, some engine works. There's his plane again. And now this, is, this has gone down in history, maybe only to aviation buffs, but this was a very important flight because what happened was they got hit by some birds. So a flock of birds, curlews as they were, flew into his plane and destroyed the windscreen. And um, when, I, when I was a little girl, I used to tell my friends that my dad was flying a mosquito and a flock of curlers hit him. <laughs> <laughs> and I probably thought a long time of mosquito as well. So it was easy to remember. Anyway, he damaged his left eye. He told me afterwards, a long time afterwards, of course, because I wasn't alive then, but he told me that he thought he was dying. He, he went like that and he got the flesh of the birds on his hand and he thought it was his flesh. He couldn't see out of either eye at that moment. And for a very short time, he actually lost consciousness. Now, what you have to remember is that the observer navigator is not a pilot, so they can't fly. So as soon as he'd lost consciousness, the plane basically nosedived down, super fast, super fast speed. And um, the navigator yanked up um, the, the, the stick and he did actually manage to stall the plane. So he managed to stop it from crashing, but the plane apparently sat up and begged. So it was a very alarming thing that, that was seen, but it did, it did save the day. And um, he, he then, Luckily, my father came round and he managed to straighten out the plane, but he still couldn't see anything. So I, I'm showing you this image here because I think it's really quite interesting as a collaborative effort. This is actually an image not from the same type of mosquito, but apparently it's very, very similar. So this here is what's going on here in the absolute nose of the plane. So this windscreen had been shot down and gone. The bodies of the birds had gone back and destroyed their radio, so they had no radio control either. And so the navigator had to climb down into here and lie along, so his face was here and he could see, 
His legs were coming up and kicking my dad's legs here in the cockpit. Two for left, one for right. And they managed to straighten the plane. And then my dad managed to see a little bit out of his right eye. And believe it or not, they managed to land the plane, perfect, a perfect landing on the third attempt. So that, that story is featured in lots of books about the mosquito, in particular, The Wooden Wonder. And it was really that incident that led to the development of bird-proof windscreens. Because before that, obviously, it was pretty treacherous. And he was subsequently awarded the DFC, although not for that, as it happens. <laughs> but it did, it did go down on the, um, it was reported and written down in lots of important places. Anyway, after that, his next most important one was the 7th of November, 1942. He flew off to the Gironde estuary to bomb some rubber ships. Another thing I had fun with when I was a little girl, as you can imagine, who was bombing some rubber ships, thinking they were ships made of rubber, not ones actually carrying rubber. So um, he left Marham, which is in Norfolk, at 12.50. And he was captured because he had to crash land. And this is what he reported in his diary about that particular event. The plane hit heavily by light flak during a 50-foot attack on a 10,000-ton blockade runner in the Gironde River at 1,600 hours. Ditched near the shore by Royan, northwest of Bordeaux, at 1610 under the cover of several gun batteries of the Atlantic Wall. Believe it or not, no injuries. So they crash landed in the sea and they were very fortunate to both be able to wade ashore. Now, here's something amazing. That previous picture that I showed you about the mosquito, I was provided with by an organization called the Pathfinder Trust who are actually trying to rebuild a whole load of mosquitoes at the moment. And they, um, when I asked them for pictures, they said they had some. And Unbelievably, this is a picture of my dad's plane when it was actually shot down the Duron Valley. We didn't have any idea that there was a picture of it. And this picture was taken by a German, and you can't really read it very easily there, but what that actually says is Englischer Flieger bei uns abgeschlossen, which apparently means English pilot shot down by us. <laughs> so there we have it. We have the record that we didn't know existed. Okay, so what happens after that when you were shot down, if you were a pilot, was you were taken to Dulag Luft. And Dulag Luft, there were a number of different Dulags, but he was taken to one in Oberursel, and there you would be interrogated. Now, what you have to bear in mind here is that the mosquito had only been in operation for a couple of months. My dad was one of the first, in, well, first pilots um, to be flying it on any kind of mission. So you can imagine that they were very, very interested indeed from an interrogation point of view. Um, I'm going to show you a little bit about it. It looks pretty homely, doesn't it? Not. <laughs> so that's where they were taken. I love the way it says POW on the roof there. Um, I presume that was actually to stop the Allied bombers from bombing it, to actually realise that they would be bombing their own people. Um, that is something that they did use to do. So Dulag Luft gets its name, shortened from Durchgangsschlager der Luftwaffe. And um, all the new POWs went there from April 1940. And if you were commissioned or non-commissioned, then you were, you were protected by the Geneva Convention of 1929, which meant that you, there were certain things they could and couldn't do to you. And the Geneva Convention basically said that you only had to give your name um, your, your serial number and your rank. That was all you had to give. But it was, it was commonly known that if you were captured, not just by the Germans, but if you were, and we probably did the same, to be honest, if you were, if you were captured, they would give you this form basically saying, what were you flying, what squadron were you in, what was your mission? And they'd hope that you would fill it in and they'd get a nice lot of intel from it. So they were all warned to, that they would be given one of these forms and that they just had to ignore it. But... Um, it was a pretty unpleasant experience and they were kept in solitary confinement for a few days to try and break them. And there were reports of, of situations where um, they, would, they, they would be just giving their name, um, rank and serial number, and then they'd, they'd hear a shot outside or something like that. And they'd say, I hope you would be more lucky like this. And so they were thinking they were going to get shot if they didn't give more information. But of course, it was all a ruse. Um, because in actual fact, for the most part, the Germans were very good at keeping to the Geneva Convention. Um, Anyway, uh, there was only so long you could keep them in solitary confinement under the convention as well. So this is a picture of what's called the cooler. So the cooler 
it seems an Americanism, we never really refer to the cooler, but it does feature in The Great Escape, doesn't it? The Cooler King. Um, so to us, that would be just solitary confinement, really. So that's where the solitary cells were, and they look pretty inviting. Wouldn't want to be in there. Okay, so he then ended up in Stella Gluft, which was in Sargon. Uh, it's now spelt Z-A-G-A-N, and it's in Poland, but um, then it was part of Germany. This is a very rough diagram that I drew myself because I couldn't find a copyright version to show you. So I just want to show you that when my father first arrived here, he would have been in this bit here, East Camp. And pretty much that was all that existed at the very beginning, but we're already in 1942 when he was shot down. So the camp was, was um, still um, relatively new. So he was there, he was in East Camp between 42 and, and um, December 42 and March 43. So you can see he was a month, a month at Dulag, a month since he was shot down. And so, yeah, then he would have been in this bit here at East Camp. Then he was moved to North Camp in March 1943. So this is North Camp here. Now, North Camp is where the Great Escape happened. But at this time, in 1943, this West Camp and this South Camp, they weren't there. OK, you need to remember that. because It's quite important from the escape perspective. So North Camp here was on the far left, if you like, of the camp. This area here, which is described as German lager, I tried to look up what lager is, and of course all the dictionaries just told me it meant beer, which, which wasn't what I wanted to know, but I presume that was where the staff, the German guards lived. Um, and this is South Camp, West Camp came later, and that's East Camp and Centre Camp there. So now they had, they, they had a bit of a laugh because they called the guards goons. And of course, we all know that goon is quite a derogatory term, and it was their way of being a bit cheeky and rude about the guards. But when the guards asked what it meant, they told them it stood for German officer or non-commissioned officer. So they got, they got away with it, basically. But the, it's really important to know about that because the Luftwaffe were very, very different to the Gestapo. The Luftwaffe were the German own air, air um, what do you call it, air force, I guess. And they did have a sort of respect for each other. So even though I'm sure my dad didn't love being a prisoner of war, but he, he did, and there were guards that he detested, I know there were, but for the most part, there was a lot of mutual respect and they, they did have some fun, as in, you'll see. <laughs> um, and the Commandant Obst, that's the name, Commandant Obst, the Colonel, um, Friedrich von Lindeiner Wildau, or Wildau as they would have said, he was actually a really honourable man and he totally and utterly followed the Geneva, sorry, the Geneva Convention to the letter. And at the time that my dad was first put in there, in this camp over here, remember, um, East Camp, there were 2,000 already in that camp. It's a lot, isn't it? 2,000 people. And by 1944, there were 10,000, because by 1944, we're talking about this whole area. And it took an area up of 59 acres, and the perimeter fence was five miles by then. And as I've already said, south and west didn't open until July 44. So... What was camp life like? Well, first of all, food was not plentiful. So the recommended intake for a healthy adult inactive man, inactive because obviously they didn't have a lot to do, <laughs> um, would still be 2,150 calories. They were getting 1,600, about enough for a small child. But they did have um, Red Cross parcels, both American, Canadian and British were all dropped there. And that helped a lot. There was also internal camp currency, and we've got some examples here. So this is from my, my dad's um, POW diary. These are actual examples of the gelt, lager gelt, sorry, as it was called. And um, at Stalag of three, all of the lager gelt was pulled. That meant that whatever rank you were, you still got a share, a fair share, an equal share. And there was something called Fudako. So Fudako was if you happen to have some personal goods have been sent to you by your family and you had too many of something, you could take it to the central store and you could barter it for something that you wanted more. And here's a typical daily menu. Breakfast, German bread with jam, and German bread is the very dark sort of pumpernickel type bread with coffee or tea. They had a lot of coffee or tea, it seems. Lunch, thin potato soup with coffee or tea. Supper, potatoes and meat roll with German bread, coffee or tea. 
and the evening snack would be toast, coffee or tea. What was it like in the living area? Well, they had 15 rooms exclusively for le uh, living and sleeping. So this is actually a picture of dad in his, um, in his room. And later these became triple bunks, but that, that came out in 1944. So at this point they were double bunks. And these are some of his friends, Ted White, Bill Greenaway, um, going up here. This is um, dad, no, that's dad. I don't know which one it is. I think that's in there. He does say, does he? Self, one. Where's one? <laughs> he must be the one in the dark. That's him there, right? Yeah, and Gordy King and Armand, who sounds French, but, but the others, I know Harry Creese, Ted White and Bill Greenaway, they were all Canadians. And there were a lot of people from the Canadian Air Force in the camp with them. Their bunks were only two foot wide, and it's important to remember that. At the, bank, at the back of each hut, there would be two rooms for more senior officers. They would have single beds. Then there'd be one other room at the back of the hut, which had two facing toilets. And three larger rooms. The first was for cooking. The second was a communal washroom and laundry. And you'd also um, wash up in there, your cooking pots. And the third was a recreational room that might have looked something like that. I'm assuming that's what that was. Well, it could be one of the bedrooms. Triple bunks introduced later. OK, so camp life. Again, here's a picture of dad with three of his friends. And this is featured, it actually comes from a book by um, a guy who was nicknamed Shag Grease. And um, I don't know if he took the photo, but in his book, he describes them as the four rogues, which was a little bit alarming. But anyway, <laughs> this is Gwyn um, Martin and my dad here, Alec. And this is Joe Red Noble, who was actually very, very prominently involved in The Great Escape. And this is a guy called Richie, who I know nothing more about. So what else were they getting up to? Well, they had recreational facilities, they had athletics, they had football, they had boxing, they had table tennis, touch football and fencing. My dad appears to have been the head of the loafing association, the loafer club, because this is a little poster he had in his diary of him shattering the record of walking around the camp fastest. And interestingly, the timekeeper here was, um, well, I, I don't know that Jay McCaig, but the assistant timekeepers was Gwyn Martin and Joe Noble, who were in the previous photographs. They had a very substantial library. So Hut 110 was actually dedicated as a library. And there were lots of educational facilities offering crafts. And some, some POWs did actually study for degrees while they were in the camp. There was a fully operational theater. And that is really interesting because you may not know this, but the carry-on film started in Stella Glove 3. The guy who wrote the, the, um, the script for it was in camp with them, and a lot of the actors that were in it were as well. So Pete Butterworth was there, Rupert Davis, and various others who went on to become West End stars and, and TV stars. And the quality was amazing, and the Germans used to come and watch it too. <laughs> And they had um, a station camp called Kriegi. I mean, that's, that's how they spelt it. But, but in actual fact, Kriegi was usually spelt K-R-I-E-G-Y, or just, just with the E, because that's how you pronounce it in German. And Kriegi was just the German word. It was short for a German prisoner of war. So they were all called Kriegis, and Stalagluf was called a Kriegi camp. Their newspaper was published twice a week. No, four times a week. Two newspapers, four times a week. Now, they also had this really important thing, prisoner verification system. So what that was, was that in the same way as they would try and catch you out when you were being interrogated by giving you a form and hoping you'd give a lot away, it was a, it was a common tactic that you might get a new prisoner um, sent to the camp who was actually not a prisoner at all. So he was a, a, an infiltrator who would try and find out what was going on in the camp, what escapes were being planned and what sort of underhand secret things they were doing. And hence, if you, if you were um, arriving as a POW, then you weren't given any information that could possibly give anything away unless you've been verified by several other people who maybe served with you or whatever. And if there wasn't anybody who'd served with you, then they, they'd just be kept at arm's length for a very long time until they proved themselves. And as far as we know, nobody managed to uh, trick their way into being told things <laughs> that, that they shouldn't have done. Now, the other thing they did that was very sneaky was they had a duty rotor. So you might be the duty officer, which meant that it was your job to know which goons, German officers, 
were in the camp at all times and where in the camp they were. So that was really important on the escape front because you needed to know where, where they might be. If they were anywhere near a tunnel, then obviously straight away you needed to resolve that and hide things. Ferret was the name that they gave to the a tunnel, um, the officers that were looking for tunnels because they were obviously digging about and, and poking about, <laughs> trying to find things. So that was the, the name that the guards um, were given if that was their role. So um, I'm just going back here to show you North Camp again. And just remember that at this point, there's nothing here, right, from the earlier picture. So here's what they decided to do. At the time, there were 2,000 POWs. Oh, yes, I need to tell you that. We're all, we're all of the opinion, maybe, that it was an officer's duty to escape. Does that sound familiar to you? But that's a myth. <laughs> That's a myth. It, it is actually true in America now, um, but that's much more recent. And it was implied in the, um, in the Great Escape film that it was the case. But in actual fact, it wasn't. But it was applauded because the, um, it was believed to be a good diversion. Remember that you were stuck in a prison camp, so you were doing nothing for the war effort. Now, if you could, if you could cause mayhem in that land, then you were doing something for the war effort. So it was, it was applauded on the point of view of being distraction and um, a waste of the, you know, the, the <laughs> waste of the Germans' times, if you like, because they were looking for escapees. And it was tolerated by the Germans. And, and it was part of the Geneva Convention that you were allowed to try and escape. So the only, the only way that you were legally allowed to shoot a prisoner is if they were running away when they were escaping. So if they, if they were caught escaping and they put their hands up and surrendered, the Geneva Convention protected them. But if they actually ran away, then you could shoot them. But you weren't supposed to shoot to kill. You were just supposed to shoot to maim and, and stop them. So, um, so having just um, told you that, I'm just going to quickly show you, because we can come back to this picture again, but um, there, here is where the tunnels are. That's Tom. So remember, that's the edge at that point. That was, that was woodland at the time. That's Harry that was eventually built, came out of hut 104. Um, and where is, oh, there's Dick. Dick came out of hut, this one of these huts, one, two, three, or this one here, I think it started at. And then later, much later, they also built George, but we'll, we'll come back to that if there's time. But Tom, Dick and Harry were the three that were all set at once. So that's the interesting thing, but this all came about. Well, yes, that's the set. I just forgot my showing that. That's the set of the film, by the way. So we're just seeing it again, a three-dimensional version here. But it is important to set the scene here because um, I keep forgetting that I'm supposed to be here for the, for the film, but of course, and I'm blocking the screen more. Um, this is the model set used. So first of all, Stalagluft comes from Stamlager Luftwaffe. Okay, so it's short for that. And the whole point of this was they knew that RAF officers were particularly ingenious and determined and they acted very well as a community. So they worked well as a community. So this camp was specifically built to be escape proof. OK, it seems a bit ironic for us because we obviously know what happened, but, but that was the plan. And um, it was partly because it had a very remote location. It was surrounded by woods. So there were woods all around here thick pine forests, the huts were built on stilts. So that meant that you could see when there was a tunnel. <laughs> and the, the ferrets, which are very well named because they were crawling around underneath the huts, obviously could see signs very easily. And if they were going to dig a tunnel, they had to have an exit point from the hut itself to get down to the, to the ground itself. Do you see what I mean? So that was definitely a deterrent, 60 centimeters up. So the other thing was that the soil was bright yellow, not the topsoil. The topsoil was a dusty gray, but the soil, as soon as you went down a few centimeters or inches as it was then, it became bright yellow. So how on earth are you going to walk around with bright yellow sand all over you and not be noticed? And how are you going to get rid of that yellow sand without being seen? And sand meant that it was prone to collapsing because it's not a very substantial solid soil. So all of those put together made it hard enough, but on top of that, they put seismograph microphones around the perimeter. 
And that was listening for any kind of vibrational sound that was going on underground. So that sounded like a pretty thorough way of making it very difficult to escape. But Roger Bushell, when he came along, he's South African. Um, he was a squadron leader at the time he was shot down. He'd already been a prolific escaper. He'd not managed to successfully escape. He'd managed to get out of the camps he was in, but he'd not managed to leave the um, occupied areas. Um, but when he was brought to Stalag Luft III, he straight away decided that he was going to become Mr. X, if you like, Big X. And um, he set up the X Committee, the Escape Committee. And they decided the best way of success was to, to build three tunnels all at once, Tom, Dick and Harry. Going back to the beds, do you remember I said, remember that the beds were only two foot wide? So what they did was they took a load of the bed boards out and used those to shore the tunnel so that it would not collapse. So they built a little frame inside the tunnel and because they were using those particular bed boards, the tunnel could only be two foot square, which is pretty small, actually, quite claustrophobic. They managed to create pulleys. This is a picture of one. So these pictures, I've got a few pictures that are much better drawn than mine. And these were all drawn by somebody called Lay Kenyon, who is a POW with dad. And um, he, he created these images at the time, but he later, gave them out to all of all of his fellow POWs who he was still in touch with. So you can see what it was like to be in this tunnel. It was pretty cramped, but this pulley was quite a clever idea. So they built little, you know, they built little railway runners, if you like. And the, the, um, these would be made of the same sort of thing, bed boards. Again, they get wood from anywhere. You'll see later when we look at, um, we look at what, what went missing from the camp when they finally did an inventory and it was shocking. But they were <laughs> getting wood from all sorts of places. Uh, and they used these to, to transport the, the actual men themselves while they were doing the digging and also to take out the sand when they when they created um, some to take away. The tunnel was managed by somebody called Woolly Floody. He was a Canadian and he was an ex miner So he was really helpful on that front. And he said to avoid the seismographs, we've got to go down 30 feet before we start. And that's quite, quite something. Yeah. So that was how deep all of the tunnels were. Tom, Dick and Harry were all 30 foot deep. And of course, they had to do the digging between Appel. So Appel was the roll call. And they used to have two a day. They had one at 9.30 and one at 5.30. And obviously, at that point, you couldn't have anybody missing. And the people who were building the tunnel, they'd have to be down there for many hours. So they had a rotor, it was very organized, this rotor of, of people in between the appel to just permanently have someone down there digging. And they tended to work naked as well, <laughs> which seems rather bizarre, but I think they just felt because of the yellow sand, they'd have less chance of being discovered if it wasn't over their clothes. Plus there was also the fact that it was quite easy to knock bits of the tunnel down if your clothing got caught and so on. So they tended, they tended not to wear any clothes. And believe it or not, they had progress of seven to eight feet a day. It's quite substantial. And it soon came to the point where it was actually really, really claustrophobic and the air was, was difficult down there and it, they could have been suffocating. So they thought we're going to have to put in a ventilation system. So that's what they did. They created some bellows and they built, they used to have um, the milk, which became, it's called Klim, milk backwards. So the, the, um, the Red Cross used to give them Klim tins. And so they, they took all those tins and put them, obviously took the bottoms off, put them one on top of each other. So they created a whole tube and that was how they created the ventilation shaft. 600 men were involved in the digging, mostly British, Canadian and American at this point. And we can see here another one of um, Lay Kenyon's drawings. You can see them climbing down. And of course, from there, they'd have to drop down the 60 centimeters below the, the um, stilts and they'd have to keep the cover on whatever was on the ground underneath there so that the ferrets wouldn't notice it when they when they went when they went down uh, big s he was an american he was in charge of security so he he had a team who were monitoring the ferrets and of course if the ferrets went anywhere near one of the tunnels they would have to be distracted so they might have to set up a row or something like that or they they'd have a boxing fight suddenly and then the guards would come and try and separate them or or they would um they would cause some kind of diversion, basically. That was all part of the role. 
And the sand, remember we said the sand was going to be difficult to dispose of. So this yellow sand, they had what they called a team of penguins. So, and that does feature in the film. So the penguins had old socks they were mostly made of, but they were like um, storage areas that you put the fill, you put the, 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 um, the sand in, you filled them with sand, and then they was, that was underneath, inside your trousers. And they would have a little device whereby as they were walking around, they could release a little bit of sand as they walked about, just a little tiny bit, they kick it in. So, so it wasn't noticeable. And they would particularly be doing that around the allotment areas because they did use to grow some of their own food, although the sand wasn't very, um, wasn't very good for that, but, but they, they would have to bury it there. So it was an elaborate ruse, if you like, that these, these penguins did use to walk a bit like that because it was heavy. Um, but that, that is feature in film and that is absolutely true. And then later, when they were running out of places to put it, they suddenly thought, well, what about under the theatre stand? We've got all that whole auditorium where we've got seat, you know, seating. We could be storing it under there. So, so later on, they started using that. And then there was a Z organisation, and they were responsible for the forged do documents, the disguises, the clothes, the maps, the, the compasses, all the sort of things that you would need to potentially make uh, an es escape successful. Oh, I forgot to say that. You may have read that, but they, they made compasses from melted razor blades and baker light records. So again, another example of just how intelligent and, and in ingenuity was used. OK, so back to the camp again here, just to remind you <laughs> what was going on at this point. Because that wasn't there, Tom here was going straight to the woods. Yep. So Tom, Dick here and Harry were all happening at the same time. Here's another image of them doing some um, digging. Now, suddenly what happened in 1943 was the US Airmen were all told they were going to be moved. They were going to be moved to the new camps, west and south. So the escape committee thought, well, that's very unfair on the Americans if they can't escape, so we better get on with it. And Tom at that point was almost finished. So they started working on Tom as quickly as they could. And then right at that moment, the Americans have been told they're going to south, right? But they then started clearing for west. And guess what that meant? That meant that Tom was going to be going into a completely cleared area. It wasn't going into the woods anymore. So it's completely useless. In fact, let me just show you again, because it also scuppered Tom was affected, and so was Dick. Because can you see Dick was going to go there as well? So one of the reasons they picked this hut for Dick was they thought no one's going to be looking at a hut that isn't even on the edge. You know, why would you, why would you pick a hut where you've got to dig even further? So this one started here and it got to about here, and it was going to go out the same way. But that was also going to now come into what they cleared for West Camp, so it was useless. So it scuppered their plans completely. And as it happens, the Germans discovered Tom anyway around that time, and they destroyed it with an explosive charge. And as I've already said, Dick was thwarted now. So, but, th but that meant that Dick could be used to store the sand because they, the Germans didn't know about Dick, <laughs> but it wasn't going to be used for escape. So all the focus switched to Harry, but they didn't feel that they could really be putting too much effort into it. Once the Germans had discovered Tom, and they were shocked at how well made Tom was. So they, they cottoned on that there must have been a very, very organized committee arranging everything. So they were on the lookout. So they had to lay low for really quite a long time. And they didn't do anything until January 1944 with regard to Harry. So this is a diagram from our dad's um, diary of Harry. And um, we can see... This is, this is the hut that it comes out of, and it was underneath, um, underneath a boiler. So they moved a boiler to, to, the Germans weren't going to look under the boiler, they reckoned. So that was a, a clever idea. And then this is the tunnel itself. It has to have a couple of changeover points because it's such a long way that they, they needed to have a point where the two people could cross, one who was leaving and one who was coming. And so they had two interchange points. We'll come back to that in a minute. And as you can see, it came all the way out under this barbed wire here, which was the edge of North Camp. It went under these buildings here, which is a coal, that was a coal shed. This was um, the cooler, 
or the solitary. And then here you had another building that was the hospital or the sick bay. So they dug under that, under this next barbed wire. And the plan was that it would come out here in the woods. So it's 320 foot long. That's pretty long, isn't it? Past two lots of barbed wire and under the cooler. It started in 104 under the stove and featured two railway interchanges. And that's the funny thing that they called them Leicester Square and Piccadilly. And by March 1944, they dug beneath the perimeter. So they thought, here we are, we're here. Now they thought escape is possible. Here's an even better diagram, one of Lay Kenyon's. So we can really see the detail here of what was going on. Here's the 30 foot drop. Here's the, you had to have little stations here for them to put the sand until it could be collected to be disposed of. You had this person was, was working the bellows, keeping the ventilation air going. And of course, this is the track. Here's somebody on their way down. Look, here's somebody just at the interchange. This um, 10 is um, Piccadilly and 11 is Leicester Square. And this is where it was going to come up in the woods. So they chose 220 men to escape. And the way they, the way they, uh, they did it was the first 100 they were called serial offenders. They were people like Roger Bushel. They had a good chance of escaping because they were either fluent in German or they were fluent in a language that was going to give them a better chance, like French or, or Belgian, maybe, or, or Dutch. So, so they had a good chance of getting back to um, their homeland. And because of that, they were given the best documents, the best disguises, the best maps. And this is really important to remember because with the documents, these were documents giving them the permission to travel. So they had to be dated. Okay, so once they'd chosen a date, then they needed to stick to it. The second hundred were known as hard asses. Sorry, I didn't name them. <laughs> and that included my dad, who was about number 151, we think. But basically, they had no, they didn't really have very good forged documents. So they wouldn't be able, because they couldn't speak the language. So they had to just hide, really, hide and run for it. So they had very little chance, really, of getting anywhere. But they could still cause a lot of disruption to the land. And um, Roger Bushell chose the date of the 24th of March. He chose it on that day. So on that day, they were going to escape in the night. And on that day, they had to put the date into all of those documents. So those documents were then only going to be valid for that particular date or for the 25th or whatever, for the next day, I guess. So moonless night, and it was the camp's most uh, disliked and efficient ferret. So the one who was most likely to discover the tunnel, he was on holiday. He was on leave. So they thought that was a good, good date to pick for that reason. And here we are, 10 p.m. at night, Johnny Bull clears the last little bit of the tunnel. Remember, they just got a tiny bit to break through and he breaks through. And unfortunately, he has a bit of a shock because things hadn't gone to plan. First of all, after 15 months of development, didn't actually make it to the woods. It came out a little bit short of the woods. And what's worse, it was right by a sentry box, by the guard, by the, the goon tower, as they called them. What's more, it was snowing, and that isn't featured in the film, but it actually was snowing on that night. And guess what that means? It means your tracks are really visible, and it also means blinking freezing cold, and you've got very little chance of surviving outdoors for several days. So it probably would at that point have been a good idea to stall it, but they couldn't because all the documents were set for that date. And, um, oh yeah, because of the shortfall, they actually had to have a system because the, the guard, the sentry guard was quite near where they were coming out and they could be seen running across, right? So they had to have a system of telling the next person it was safe to come up or as safe as possible. So they had to organize some rope and then somebody ran into the trees and hid in the trees and the rope went down into the tunnel and they had a little signal, something like two pulls for stop, um, one for go, right? It's very simple, but, but they had to have a system. Then an even bigger problem, there was an air raid and then there was a power cut. So all the, of that, I'd forgotten to tell you this, but they actually had lights in the tunnel, would you believe, because they'd stolen some electric cable and they'd managed to set up electric lights in there. But the bad news with that was when there was a power cut, it was plunged into complete darkness. So people in the tunnel didn't know what on earth was going on. And it really delayed things because they, they were only getting out 12 an hour and they were planning on one a minute. So it was significantly down on, on plans. 
And because already by now, a lot of the evening had gone, they had, they had um, realized that they would have to stop at curfew. They had to, they had to be ready for you know, various things. So they thought we're not gonna get everyone out. So the second hundred were told, don't bother. Don't bother going to get ready, just forget it, right? Because curfew meant that they couldn't be seen outside the huts. And obviously you had to go from wherever your home hut was to the one where the tunnel was. So they would, couldn't be seen out at that time of night. By dawn, 76 men had made it into the trees and the 77th was poised to go. And that's the, the rope, right? So that's the guy in the woods signaling. So this is the point at which they were discovered. A patrolling sentry deviated from his beat. The person in the woods put the signal to stay put and the 77th person misread it as go. So he came running out practically right on top of the sentry, unfortunately. He'd first noticed the tracks and then he very quickly noticed the POW. He fired a warning shot and he blew his whistle. A few of them outside the tunnel made a run for it. The person who was in the tunnel came out and the two behind, because there were loads already backed up, you can imagine, they thought, oh, we've got to get back as fast as we can block the entrance and burn all the documents and, burn, and get rid of the, the costumes, and, you know, because they could be in big trouble. So that was their focus next, was to get rid of the evidence, basically. Oh, and they, they ate all their rations as well that they were supposed to be taking, pigging themselves so that they didn't get it taken off them. Uh, shots were, were fired, the ferrets couldn't find the tunnel entrance. And in the end, um, Charlie Pilts, who was one of the ferrets, he, he went down from the end where they discovered the escapee, and he walked back up the 320 feet. He couldn't get out because, of course, they blocked, they blocked it. And they could hear him in there. And they thought, oh, I suppose the game's up. You know, we better, better let him in. But it bought them a bit of time to get rid of stuff anyway. And because of all the delays, because we had the, um, well, as you said, the power cut and everything else, the fact they didn't get out when they should have done, you had all sorts of escapers who couldn't use their documents because they'd missed the train that their documents were all set up for. So they all had to start walking instead of, instead of using transport. And that meant that many were caught in the Sagan area. We should have said about phones at the beginning. Sorry about that. Right, can you turn it off? <laughs> right, okay. And the aftermath was that the, um, despite the escape group nature of the camp, um, you know, to get 76 out was pretty amazing, frankly. And it still remains to this day the, the greatest escape in World War II and one um, in terms of numbers. Um, not surprisingly, Hitler was pretty furious. And um, he actually ordered all the captured escapers to be shot, which was, of course, in direct convention of um, direct, sorry, contravention of the Geneva Convention. And apparently Himmler supposedly um, what would you say, bartered it down to 50, but those 50 were all shot. And the reports were put down as the prisoners, whilst relieving themselves, bolted for freedom and were shot whilst trying to escape. And that's because it was allowed under the Geneva Convention to shoot them if they were trying to escape. But of course they weren't. Well, they were, but they weren't actually resisting. They weren't resisting recapture. The Commandant, he was um, arrested and court-martialed. And the prisoners and the Luftwaffe alike were horrified. And apparently many of the Luftwaffe were going around the camp saying, please don't think it was down to us. It wasn't, it wasn't. So you have to understand it's such a major difference that the Luftwaffe were involved in not Gestapo because they're a very, very different animal. Of the 77, 50 were executed. 19 were returned to Stalag of three. Six were sent to Sachsenhausen, which of course was um, um, a, a pretty horrible camp, wasn't it? Much worse. Two to Colditz, another escape-proof one, supposedly. And only three, three made it back to England. And two of those were Norwegians and the other was Dutchmen. So um, after the war, the Gestapo were held to account for the atrocities of killing the 50, tried as war crimes. Okay, so immediately after the tunnel, those remaining in the camp were made to stand naked outside for about four hours or two, two hours, but it was snow. So that was pretty horrible for them. Um, and that was a bit of a punishment, but also that they were being strip searched, obviously, and everything. And not only that, they were deliberately trying to mess up the appell because they didn't want it to be obvious who was missing. 
So they were all swapping places and probably saying yes to the wrong names and all sorts. So that probably didn't help their case with how long they were kept outside. Um, everyone was very shocked. Um, Alec, he, he wrote all the names of the 50 and what they did, their age and, and what had happened to them. It was very sad. And he noted the ones that came in the same purge as him. And the new commandant was much stricter. There were all sorts of Gestapo investigators everywhere. So they were all, everyone was edgy. And um, finally, or later, the POWs were allowed to build a memorial. And in fact, the Foreign Secretary acknowledged it all in the House, House of Commons on the 19th of February. Um, and eventually, would you believe, after all that, because they'd been warned that don't try escaping after that, they still started work on George, <laughs> but it never actually went anywhere. Um, so we don't need that because I think I did show you. So, so the thing with George was it was here, but this was a little bit of woodland between the camps. So I guess they were aiming to just come out there and get out. So they were very, <laughs> they were very determined. We'll give them that. Okay, here's some shocks. This is what they'd taken from the camp with getting away with it. 4,000 bedboards, 1,317 beading battens, 1,212 bed bolsters, 52 20-man tables, 10 single tables, 34 chairs, 76 benches, and they were all used to shore up the tunnels. Wait for it, there's more. 3,424 towels, 635 mattresses, 192 bed covers, and 161 pillowcases to muffle the sound. 1,290 knives, 30 shovels, 478 spoons, 582 forks, 246 watering cans, and 14,000 powdered milk cans. They were all used for digging, ventilation, and 600 foot of rope, 69 lamps, 1,000 foot of electricity cable, and they'd all been hooked up to supply fighting. It's quite incredible, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, so um, I'm actually run out of time pretty much. If you, because uh, we started only a very little bit late, but do you want me to continue? Because I have got more, but that's the end of the actual great escape part. But I've got some about the evacuation of the camp, which is that the general consensus? Okay, right. So um, on the 12th of January, there were lots of rumors that the Russians were very close to the camp. And um, at that point, they'd begun their great offensive and they were only 200 miles roughly from Sagan, 300 from Berlin. So they started to have rumours inside the camp that the, that the camp would be evacuated. And they didn't really believe it because they weren't sure how possible that would be. But um, in his diary, Dad notes that he and some of his, his mates, they got to work on making backpacks just in case. So at the end of January, they were less than 12 miles away and the sound of battle was constant. And then Hitler um, ordered evacuation on the 27th of January and the POWs were told to prepare to march that night, perhaps within the hour. So it's pretty short notice. And um, anything that's in, um, in italics is, is from my dad's diary. <laughs> um, so pandemonium was widespread. We ate as much food as possible. We hurriedly packed our bags. For my own part, the previous day I'd washed a set of heavy underwear and six pairs of woolen socks. The socks were almost dry, but I had to discard the former because it wasn't dry, obviously. A bit annoying because it was cold. Anyway, here's what he took. A pair of trousers, a set of combinations, six pairs of socks, two shirts, one pair of shoes, a towel, toilet requisites, one pound of tobacco, 200 cigarettes, two notebooks, two sets of lightweight underwear, two packs of cards, two pipes, six boxes of matches, a service duty cap, a knife, fork, spoon, and enamel bowl. And he says he was wearing his heavy underwear, two pairs of socks, heavy boots, sweatshirt, scarf, balaclava, two wool sweaters, tunic and great coat, two watches and pockets full of odds and ends, soap, cigarettes, gloves, and a penguin book, The Life of Nelson. <laughs> uh, all his available food was packed into two suitcases, which they aimed to carry on long poles. And after various delays, they finally passed through the camp at 1.15 on the 28th of January in batches of 150. On the way out, they received an unexpected benefit of a Red Cross parcel. And actually you could take more if you could carry it. And Ted Muggeridge apparently took two. And that took their individual load up to 30 to 40 pounds each, plus about 80 pounds on the poles. And bear in mind what they're wearing as well. So that's A, heavy, and B, not very easy to manoeuvre in. Now the weather was bitterly cold 
and it was a clear night with brilliant moonlight. Okay, so this is just some facts. This is not out of his, his diary, but I'll move on to the diary then if you want me to finish. Over 10,000 men marched through the gates that night. The conditions were extreme, sub-zero temperatures, thick covering of snow, and it was said to be one of the coldest German winters in living memory. The column stretched for five kilometers. The men marched hour after hour with only 10 minute halts. And the POWs were not the only ones on the road that day. Lots of the, um, the people who lived in the eastern parts of Germany were all evacuating because they were very afraid of the Russian reprisals if they were caught up with. And so there were lots of people on those roads, most of which were POWs, but lots of other um, evacuees as well. Okay, so these, these are all from Dad's diary. Um, and as I said, if you, if you do want me to just give you a flavor of the sort of things that was, was happening, this is just reading for extracts. Um, and we don't need to be using the slides, we'll just go to the end. The German guards were spaced about every 10 yards along each side of the columns. We understood that our destination was to be Halbo, a town 17 kilometers away, and our total march would be about 70 kilometers, which you can imagine in all that they're wearing and carrying all those things. Um, and then they would be moved somewhere else. For the first few miles, both sides of the roads were lined with discarded baggage, great coats, boxes, tins, etc. The local civilians must surely have had a field day when they woke up. Our party of eight discarded nothing. We picked up odd pieces of string and sheets and lashed our parcels onto two more poles. Later, we found parts of a suitcase and attached string to it for use as a sleigh. After a few short rests and much sweating, <laughs> we arrived at Halbo, where we were told that a stay of an hour would be allowed for eating. It was 7.30 a.m. Remember, they'd left about 1.30, so they'd been trudging for six hours through the night in that sub-zero weather. The weather had turned very cold and after about 10 minutes, we were all chilled through. However, we consumed a portion of frozen corned beef together with some bread and a chunk of margarine and a similar state of solidity. A German Frau in a nearby house supplied us with hot water, which we drank as it was and paid for with fags and soap. We plugged along. One guard, one German guard, was so heavily laden with food that had been discarded that he fell down three times in five minutes. During this leg, continuously driving snow commenced, which was to continue for the next 48 hours. Eventually, we reached Friedelvau, having completed 28 kilometers in about nine hours. Bill Greenaway got cracking on a sledge for our party, ably assisted by the rest of us. It was bitterly cold and about two o'clock on a Sunday afternoon. The sledge was a tremendous improvement. We took turns in pulling two and pushing two men with poles. As we pulled out of the town, we passed members of West Camp sleeping in the snow by the wayside. I've never yet spent a night as cold as that one, but managed to doze off for an hour or two. My feet were so cold that I decided to put my boots on in the middle of the night, an almost impossible task as the leather was frozen iron hard. Next morning, we had hot water at seven and after the usual frosty meal got away at eight. About this time, we discovered our tin of rolled oats had been robbed of its contents, a heavy blow to us, a por as porridge is one of the great luxuries in this land of poverty. We had tramped 63 kilometers in 41 hours, including 15 hours in a barn, humping a heavy load under the most difficult conditions. Personally, I was completely and utterly exhausted. So, I mean, that went on for another few days. And in fact, if we go to slide 40, You'll just see an image of them doing the march. And since leaving Sagan, a week had passed, during which time we'd now walked 96 kilometers to Spremberg in three days of marching. Many had fallen sick by the wayside with pneumonia, pleurisy, frostbite, and old injuries reasserting themselves. And uh, in fact, one, um, number 41 just shows the map. So that's the complete journey, but some of it was by train. But, you know, they were in a pretty poor state. The final 300 kilometers was in a cattle truck. Yeah, and many, many were very, very ill by then. So after that, he was moved um, to various other camps and um, we'll, we'll just um, go on to the next slide. Yeah, these are the various places that he was moved to. And he arrived back home on the 7th of May. Picture, the final one on that one is a picture of the diary with him arriving back via Brussels, I think. And there he is, <laughs> the airport at Brussels. And he, um, he was demobbed in 1945. Yep. He joined, rejoined the Air Force in 47. He ended up leaving as a squadron leader. 
he was a BOAC and then a BA um, pilot instructor, and he started Alec Brissot Travel in 1963. We had first shop in Chertsey, then two in Woking um, and Isha, and uh, Walton on Thames. Yeah. So um, I wanted to just tell you that the Alec Bristow travel poster and cinema advertising campaign, don't know if any of you remember, it was a hot air balloon and it used to say, the great escape begins at Alec Bristow travel, <laughs> um, which was obviously lost on most people, but, but rather fun, yes. And he ran his travel agencies until he died. If you want to go on to the final slide. It's a little poem that he wrote in the camp. Lines written in the sunshine on the 25th of March, 1945 at Tarmstedt. Sing on, sweet lark, delight me with your music. Your freedom holds the essence of my dreams. High o'er my captive soul you preach of beauty, winging it back to England, shady streams and other glories sacrificed for duty. Thank you. Thank you.